the entire agri-food sector bears the brunt of the climate crisis. Pour parler d'agriculture et d'Europe à la jeunesse. Proteste der Landwirte zeigen, wie wichtig der strategische Dialog ist. La PAC est plus du tiers du budget total de l'Union européenne. We have to find a new consensus on the future of agriculture. It's time for the final parade on the catwalk. Five competitors in a fierce battle to win the prize of Blondes of the Year 2024. Let's give them all a big round of applause. Je pense qu'on peut déjà tous les applaudir. Their names are Odyssey, Nefertiti, Lynette and Louisa. Four blondes showing off their shapely bodies and gentle character to judges. Yes, it's a beauty pageant, but these blondes are blondes d'Aquitaine, cows. And the judges are at the Librement Agricultural Fair in Belgium, scrutinizing every muscle and curve of these elegant beasts as their breeders look on in pride. In this podcast, we look at a sector of agriculture that often ends up as the butt of criticism for various reasons, livestock farming. To many environmental campaigners, livestock farming is responsible for poor animal welfare standards and greenhouse gas emissions. But what about the many positive environmental effects that livestock systems provide? Welcome to the 45th edition of Food for Europe. In first place, the Marcourt family. Their breeding is very balanced, very nice, very consistent. You can see in the race, in the finesse, the skin, the limbs. There's lots of muscles there. There's volume. Many congratulations to the breeders. Let's give them a round of applause. For the Food for Europe team present at this iconic celebration of the best of Belgian farming, this is a moment to behold. But for the breeders competing, it's central to their livelihoods and identities as livestock farmers, striving for excellence and the highest standards. We spoke to the winner of the Blonde 2024 event, the human winner that is, an event that celebrated the most beautiful examples of the Blonde d'Aquitaine breed of cattle. We've won, and it's the product of a lot of self-sacrifice. It's also a recognition of our work. It means that our peers tell us that we've done a good job, and they encourage us to continue our efforts. And so for you, is livestock farming a viable occupation for the future? Can you continue to do it? That's a different question. Yes, in niche sectors with a lot of difficulties, a lot of administrative headaches that have nothing to do with the skills this sector demands. As a consequence, quite a few farmers have given up because the challenges make it very difficult to encourage young people to work in the sector. We are lucky to have a 24-year-old son who's got the bit between his teeth. So we encourage him and we wish him good luck for the future, of course. Luck is needed, of course, but what farmers really want is for their work to be properly valued, a complaint which was at the heart of the farmers' protests that erupted across Europe in early 2024. In Belgium, initiatives in this direction are gathering pace. At Librement, we spoke to a veterinarian who's also a member of a farming cooperative. I'm Nicolas Perrault. I'm a veterinarian by training. I came back to work in a farmers' cooperative called Live From My Livestock, which brings together a hundred farmers throughout Wallonia and which aims to negotiate directly with supermarkets and small to medium-sized distributors to have better traceability and price transparency. The livestock sector is suffering economically, but it's also suffering from its image. The impression is given that livestock farming is destroying the planet, but this doesn't differentiate between the different types of livestock farming. In our country, it's still a very traditional sector and is not at all industrialized. The value of our work should be recognized. There are many preconceived ideas about livestock farming, especially in terms of animal welfare. Images are circulated that sometimes even come from outside Europe, or that are taken from isolated and regrettable events in slaughterhouses. These images give the impression that the farmer takes pleasure in making his animals suffer 
suffer, that the whole agri-food chain wants to make the animals suffer. This is totally false. It's obviously the opposite. To be a breeder, to earn so little, to work so much, you really have to be brave and passionate and above all to love your animals. And in any case, an increase in animal welfare contributes to an increase in production and therefore profitability. It's a message that seems to have been heard by the European institutions. Before going to Libremont, Food for Europe went to visit the European Commissioner for Agriculture and Rural Development, Janusz Wojciechowski, in his office on the 10th floor of the iconic Berlaymont building Hello, I have a meeting in Brussels. Okay, I'll get Commissioner Wojciechowski for you. Hello, Commissioner. Thanks for finding the time. Thank you very much for, for coming. Commissioner, in the aftermath of the Second World War, public policies favoured intensive farming to the detriment of animal welfare in order to meet Europe's need for food security. What is the situation today? In the current uh, common agricultural policy, we introduced a very important instrument uh, supporting livestock farmers, which is animal welfare eco schemes. I'm happy that majority of member states used this uh, opportunity because this is voluntary for member states, voluntary for farmers. But payment for the farmers who voluntarily introduced higher standards over the minimum level of the animal welfare standards increased. In the previous CAP, 2014-2020, it was only 1.5 billion euro. And uh, in the current CP, 2021-27, this is 6.3 billion euro. For example, this is the summer grazing, this is more space for animals in buildings, free range farming, etc. This is also very good for the promotion of uh, our products, uh, the highest uh, standards of animal welfare in the world. During the Belgian presidency of the Council of the European Union in the first half of 2024, you had the opportunity to visit farms in Belgium and to meet with farmers. What struck you? Yes, I can observe that this farming, which uh, is very close to, to my heart and to my vision of the future of agriculture, extensive farming with the animals, free grazing, and uh, the forestry, of course, agroforestry, which is sustainable agriculture. And absolutely, this is uh, the model which um, should be supported in, in, in the future. The only problem being that this model is still struggling to establish itself at the European level among farmers who fear for the profitability of their farms. And then there's the image problem that just won't go away. The problem that in the collective imagination, livestock farming, whether extensive or intensive, is perceived as a cause of global warming. Nicolas Perrault. Ruminants emit methane, which is a gas that warms the atmosphere, so people believe that cattle are part of the problem, except that the ruminant is in a balance where the methane it emits is captured by the meadow where it grazes. And that's the whole issue. The ruminant is not just an animal, but an entire ecosystem. Food for Europe discussed this environmental issue in general, and methane in particular, with Léonard Terron, who was presiding over the opening session of the Libre Montfer. Hi everybody, welcome to Libremont's Fair. My name is Léonard Terron. I first started my career as a rural veterinarian, taking care of cows in the field. And for the past 10 years, I've been creating innovative companies in the agricultural sector. Hello, Léonard. So, methane, produced by farm animals. A genuine problem or not? Methane is a carbon that is biogenic, which means that it's produced by the digestion of plants which themselves are the result of photosynthesis, which has itself trapped atmospheric carbon. So we are on a cycle that is almost in balance when we respect the soil. It becomes problematic when you try to produce meat without it being in balance with the ecosystem. And these are typically ultra-intensive models with large concentrations of animals, but which are not at all the dominant model in Europe, which is what we call mixed farming, a farm that has animals to feed the soil, soils that feed humans and animals, and there the circle is complete. Would Léonard Terron's ideal model make it possible to do without synthetic fertilizers? Russia's war against Ukraine has brought home to the European agricultural sector and consumers just how dependent we have become on synthetic fertilizers produced in Ukraine and Russia, and more broadly our dependence on oil and gas for our food security. 
The unique characteristic both of breeding large and small ruminants is that it's the only natural fertilizer based on nitrogen and carbon combined. What I mean by that is that the fertilizer is neither overloaded with nitrogen nor with carbon. We manage to provide a substrate that is perfectly balanced with the needs of the soil. So we have to work on a kind of extension of the European style model, at least the one we have in our latitudes, so a system where livestock farming is in balance with the soil and in balance with plant production. After having favoured intensive livestock farming for several decades after World War II, it's now time to return to the balance of ecosystems, according to Janusz Wojciechowski, European Commissioner. No, intensive farming is not a good solution for the future of the, the European agriculture. I'm very much in favour of the sustainable uh, livestock farming. This is my recommendation for the next common agriculture policy to introduce redistributive payment for sustainable mixed farms, having in their farm crop production and uh, livestock. Future uh, common agriculture policy should support extensive sustainable livestock farming. I played this part of the Commissioner's interview to Clotilde de Montpellier, who has been fighting for fair remuneration for producers since 2017. My name is Clotilde de Montpellier. I am a geographer by training. I set up as a farmer here in Wallonia, in the Condro area, on a mixed farm, and I founded the Farm for Good Cooperative with other farmers, which today unites around 100 Belgian farmers. Thanks, Clotilde, for giving us your time today. Welcome to Libramont. What do you think of the Commissioner's statement in favour of mixed farms? It's excellent news that this is the direction he favours. I think this project should be given a name, and it should also go further to include organic farming. It's a project that is just as ambitious as the mixed farm project, and that complements it well. It takes us straight in the direction of resilient and sustainable agriculture. Today, the scientific community has analysed the situation comprehensively and we know where we need to go. Europe really needs to take us much further in terms of ambition and each new agricultural policy should bring added value. They shouldn't go one way one year and another the next. They should say, this year we're doing this and, if we succeed, we'll go further the following year. That's really choosing the AND strategy. That's fundamental because, indeed, the changes of focus only serve to destroy and totally discourage the farmers or entrepreneur, whoever he or she may be. Beyond the environmental aspects, however, there remains a key issue for farmers, that of economic profitability. This is a fundamental subject. The Farm for Good Group's primary project is how to boost the farmer's income by trying to rebuild value chains that are more transparent, that fit into the specifications of manufacturers, to promote a dialogue with all the links in the chain on the impacts and on the person who produces this raw material. It probably doesn't have universal support, this suggestion. What is the most important element of your argument that can rally skeptics to your side? Le prix. The price. There's nothing more to say when the manufacturer pays 20% more on the raw material and it goes into the farmer's pocket. That means we have a commitment and a promise that is strong. You have to understand the farmer. He must be able to earn a living. He has often been cheated by buyers. Even today, there are prices that are just unacceptable and so we reassure him immediately on these aspects. Extensive livestock farming is also agroforestry, as was highlighted during the Librement Agricultural Fair. This means a method of livestock farming that reconciles forestry and pastoral objectives. Both activities contribute to the rural economy, shaping the landscape and boosting biodiversity. In short, improving the quality of life for all of us. But this is not necessarily self-evident. Leonard Theron. 
In fact, the forest is in competition with livestock farming because what the forest gains, the grasslands lose. So we have to work on a model of coexistence, and agroforestry is probably the first answer. Historically, agroforestry was used to produce firewood and to provide transitional fodder in times of scarcity. And so, in fact, people were self sufficient in heating and food, with a coexistence between forestry on the one hand and livestock farming on the other. Today, trees are cut down in Europe, processed abroad, often in Asia, and brought back to Europe in the form of planks or furniture. All these great cycles made sense when oil was cheap and when we were not aware of its impact. But if we want to restore the forest to a place in balance with livestock farming, we need to place a higher value on the science around agroforestry and therefore the data and models. Because very often a farmer thinks, if I plant trees, I will lose productivity in my soil. When in reality, embracing forestry will restore 20% of productivity to the soil over about 30 meters all around. Travailler en sylviculture va rendre 20% de productivité au sol sur à peu près 30 mètres. Before leaving Janusz Wojciechowski, I asked him if he had a message for the participants of the Libre Montfer. First of all, thank you very much for your contribution to ensure food security in European Union in this very difficult uh, time. We are doing everything which is possible to support you to simplify common agricultural policy rules. Thank you also for your protest, for your demonstrations, because it was helpful to find the solution and to give the positive answer for your protest. We asked our three interlocutors in Libramont to listen to this message. First reaction, Leonard Terron. I think we're realizing that public policies must be guided by the grassroots. What I also hear in his message is gratitude for what we're doing. In fact, the value of our leaders has always been measured by the level of food security. The role of our Europe today is to bring back coherence. And so what we need for the future is to look at the models that work and, above all, stability. Farmer Clotilde de Montpellier. I hear recognition and gratitude for farmers in his remarks. And in fact, it resonates very strongly with me. I am impressed by how massive the work done by the farmers is. Nicolas Perrault, vet and farm cooperative member. It's definitely a message that makes you happy. Now I think we need to go beyond words, follow up with strong actions to reconcile agriculture and Europe. Before concluding this podcast, I wanted to share with you an encounter we had in Libremont with Manu Laruel, a breeder from the Liège region, a passionate farmer who in April 2024 welcomed the 27 European Ministers of Agriculture and Commissioner Janusz Wojciechowski to his mixed crop and livestock farm. J'ai dit oui tout de suite. I said yes right away. There were more or less 120 people coming. In the end, I think, all the European ministers were really of the same opinion. They learn much more by visiting a farm and seeing how we work rather than by just sitting in an office. They realize that we work a lot. I really try to work in a circular manner. The manure that the animals produce is used to feed the soil, and then I plant beets. From the beets, we get sugar to feed humans. And what's the byproduct of beets? It's the pressed pulp, which is used to feed our cows. And our cows produce meat and milk. These are two proteins that are very necessary for humans. And so the ministers realize that it's a truly circular economy, not at all intensive. And the animals were not being fed with soya or GMOs. So there you have it. I think it's a really positive evolution. Let's hope it works. Et j'espère que ça va être efficace. And that brings us to the end of this 45th episode of Food for Europe. Thank you to all my guests for their contribution to this podcast. The next time you go shopping for meat, if you do, think about the breed, the manner of breeding and the origin of what you're consuming. We'll be back with a new episode at the end of the summer holidays. Until then, have a great summer. The entire agri-food sector bears the brunt of the climate crisis. Pour parler d'agriculture et d'Europe à la jeunesse. Proteste der Landwirte zeigen, wie wichtig der strategische Dialog ist. La PAC est plus du tiers du budget total de l'Union européenne. We have to find a new consensus on the future of agriculture.